We're going to sing a song called Noel. Lauren Daigle sings it. And there's a purpose, a couple of purposes for this. First, because it's a beautiful song to worship Christ. Um, also, to give you preparation for next week, because our kiddos are going to be singing this for you, and it's going to be far more fun next week. But take this in, learn the song so you can sing with them. seated. I feel like such a rebel. You say you may be seated, and I get up. You say stand up, sitting down. <sighs> During that song, I was thinking, though, Stacy Halbrick, that key was good for you, right? That was a good key. I know that because I try and sing it in my male voice, and I'm like bottoming out on my low end, and just doesn't quite work the way I want it. 
Welcome to Cornerstone, all y'all. It's so good to see you. What a joyous time of year, and yet some very hard things. It was at quarter to one this morning that I got the text message that Al Manning had passed. I know some of you know Al, many of you don't. Al has had a large part in uh, Lost Timber Camp that a lot of our kids go to. He loves kids deeply. Uh, to make a few connections for you, I got a message from John Greener at one o'clock in the morning. John is the son-in-law. John is the Ephri pastor over at Wyndham. His wife is the daughter of El. Also, Cole Onken, who you know, his girlfriend, Emily, who they've been serious for quite a while. That is her father. So just so you can make some of those connections. Well, this morning we're going to be talking about the journey, and we're talking about the journey from new creation to the likeness of Christ, and then I've got some code words here for you, the dash, the unwanted journey, and the joy, some passages here. Even though the New Testament tells us that there is a definitive starting point for our sanctification that begins when we say yes to God. To remember, as I'm not going to re-preach last week's sermon, but just to remember that we are justified before God when we say yes, when we surrender to him. We are already given the righteousness of Jesus Christ placed on us. We are positionally sanctified before God at that point. From then on out, we are in him, in his hands, and nothing can snatch us out. We are his. And now we live out the calling to walk, not because we are trying to earn something, but because we have been set free and our goal is to become like Christ, which we will be in the end. And I loved it so much this morning. I came to the CRC service and the pastor was talking about the Ten Commandments and he was so right on and boy, what a great message it was this morning. He was so eloquent and articulate in preaching the deep things of God. And he was talking about the Ten Commandments. And those commandments are, and you think about them, in one aspect, they are a command. You shall not lie, you shall not covet, but they are also prophetic in where we are heading. And what he was saying was, it's like I could say, you shall one day be in heaven in glory. You shall not lie. Prophetic in the sense, you will one day attain this in Christ Jesus. Not because of your own effort, but because of what God is doing in you. What a beautiful picture. So it fit in so well. And I believe that the dash that we are gonna talk about has a purpose and it has a reason. There's a reason for the dash and we'll talk about that. But let's talk about this from new creation to the life perfected in Christ. It doesn't seem that this is working for me, Ashley, so you're probably gonna have to, oh, Ashley is not there. Okay, well, there we go. Okay, one more. All right, so new creation. So then my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now even more in my absence, Hear this, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So first off, that seems like, well, that's a pretty big weight. We are to work it out. And we are called to do that. Work out your salvation. You're on this path of being sanctified. Work it out. But don't miss the next verses. For it is God working in you enabling you both to desire and to work out his good purpose. So there is that surrendering, and, and we need to jump on board with it and, and say, yes, Lord, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take up that invitation to be a part of this, but it's God at work in you to sanctify you. 
Till when? Well, oh, now it's working. Okay, we're good to go now, Corey. Unless you're clicking at the exact same time I am, we're good. Romans 6, 19. For just as, just as you offered the parts of yourselves as slaves to moral impurity and to greater and greater lawlessness, you, that's what you were doing? You were on a path to greater and greater lawlessness just as offer them, offer, now offer them as slaves to righteousness, which results in sanctification. And so you see those connecting words, just as, meaning in the same way that you're going down that hole, now in your righteousness, which has been put on you, now in greater and greater degrees, working towards the likeness of Christ. Last week, dis we discussed the beginning point of sanctification, and we looked at the, the story of Mary being told what was gonna take place and the fear that she might have had as this young teenage girl, and her response was, I am the Lord's servant. I'll do this. I'm his slave. May it be as your word says. And that's to be our response. So, when we respond in that way, yes, Lord, I'm gonna surrender to you. May it be as you said, that's a big deal. And that's what we talked about last week, that we have been regenerated, we have been reunited, reconciled with God through that. We are new creations in Christ. We have been adopted. We have been given the Holy Spirit as a seal and as the one who will sanctify us and the one that will see this transformation take place. Now, on the other end of life, when we get to the place where our brother Al Manning stepped last night at quarter to one in the morning, when we get to that place, it will be completed in us. We are not complete until we get to that place. And so in one sense, we are mourning with the Manning family. And in another sense, we are rejoicing because Al had a great faith. And even as he was going to death, Al was saying, it's okay. It's okay. God's got this is what he was saying. See, n neither life nor death can separate us from God. So at the point when we come to that place where this life is done and these bodies give out, if we are in him, then our spiritual growth is complete and we are matured. Until then, we are living what I'm calling the dash. Let's pray and then we're gonna talk a little more about the dash. So our heavenly Father, God, it's your word that tells us that you formed us in our mother's womb in Psalm 139. And your word also tells us that you know each of the numbered days of our lives, also in Psalm 139. So Lord, you know the day of our birth. You know the day when this body will give out. You know the day of those who are given new birth in you. And you know the day that each of us will take our last breath. And so, Lord, we also know that you know our thoughts and you know our needs. And you know. Father, you know the broken hearts in Missouri, in Arkansas, in Kentucky, in Tennessee, in the 200 mile path of these tornadoes. Lord, you know the sadness and sorrow of telling your dad, I'll see you later, and knowing that it could be a long time. Lord, you know our lives more intimately than we know them. And Father, with the very heart of each of us, I pray that you would help us to surrender to you completely. 
and say, okay, I am the Lord's servant. May it be as your word says. Amen. So the dash. What is the dash? Well, you have likely heard it talked about, sometimes at funerals, the dash. You know, you have that date on the tombstone that will say, this is when they were born, this is when they died, but the dash, that's when they lived. It's the in-between. Most specifically, I am talking about the dash between new creation in Christ and becoming like Christ. So maybe on my tombstone, somebody could have it put that born here, new birth, 1987, and then we'll just fill in, you know, somewhere around 2069 or so, when I'm 100 years old. I don't know when it's going to be. Could be tomorrow. Could be today. I don't know. But that, that new birth is an important place. It's significant, isn't it? Well, that's the dash that we are most closely going to be looking at. I'm going to use three descriptive verses which the Bible uses in this. We are given new birth. We are born again. And we are a new creation in Christ. Those are three descriptives that Scripture uses in reference to that point at which God's Holy Spirit puts a seal on you and says, adopted, mine, stamp is on them. So from that point, this dash, 2 Corinthians 5.17 to 1 John 3.2 is what we are talking about. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Look, new things have come. Dash. We will be like him. From 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. That's the dash we're talking about. So the question that I think we all have, whether we verbalize it or not, might look like this, and sometimes it's with exasperation. Why the dash? What is the purpose of the dash? Why do I have to get up on a Saturday morning to turn on the news and find out that tornadoes have ravished, ravaged, some, maybe I'm ravished, but ravaged the country and lives are gone? Why do I have to go through hard things? You've thought this way, haven't you? Haven't you thought about the fact, why didn't God just create us to be in heaven in the first place and just be with him? Wouldn't that be nice? I created you, now you're with me, and this is perfect. Why the dash? Why this life? Why in bodies that are going to deteriorate and be put in a grave? Why all of that? And, and please don't take the wrong theology thinking that this isn't God's first plan. This is God's first plan. If you didn't realize that, Adam and Eve, when they, when they fell into sin, that wasn't God going, I didn't see that coming. Now what do we do? Hey, I've got an idea. Jesus, we're going to send you down there. It wasn't his second plan. He knew all this was going to look like this. He allowed it. Am I the only one that asks why sometimes? My guess is that you probably do as well. So why this world? Why life? Well, first off, let me just say these are bigger questions that I or anybody else could answer in a half-hour sermon. Really not even in a lifetime. But the scripture gives us very clear direction 
and a road and a path that we go down and we see the answers and we begin to get it revealed to us what is taking place. And by the way, um, you know, thinking about the destruction and sorrow and the hard things, Exodus 2, five, or excuse me, Exodus chapter 2, 23 to 25 After a long time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned because of their difficult labor. They cried out, and their cry for help ascended to God because of the difficult labor. So God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Verse 25 begins with these two words. God saw. God saw the Israelites, and he took notice. I just want you to not forget God sees. He knows. And it's not without purpose. So firstly, as we look at trying to answer this, why the dash? I think the overarching thing that we need to remember is Isaiah 43, 7. Everyone called by my name and created for my glory, I have formed him, indeed I have made him. Overall, the ultimate reason for life and why we are here and why we exist at all is for God's glory. Ultimately, that's why we were created. So I just want you to know, if you are going down any road for your own glory, it will be put to an end at some point, just so you know that. If you are not going down a road that leads to giving glory to God, you will never be satisfied. It's never going to be enough. You will never succeed because you are created for God in his glory. So, question, (laughs) how on earth does all this bring God glory? All this hard stuff and all of these things. So what's the point to the daily grind? And if we're honest, we can say it's much more than a daily grind. It is looking at the news and seeing about those who have died tragically. In fact, I was reminded of this fact when this last week I was going through, I, I was doing a, one of our garden steal away videos that Marnie and I do. And it's a video of us going down to the Lexington, Kentucky Arboretum. That was my video that I posted this last week for Garden Steelaway. It was a video that we recorded while we were on sabbatical. It was a nice warm day. It was, it was uh, us walking through, and Marnie and I are walking through the gardens because the thing that we're trying to do is to remember the beauty. And the gardens help us. By the way, I hate gardening. I love walking through gardens with my wife, and I really am starting to see the beauty, and I'm even learning names like Menarda as a flower, not just a place that I go to pick up wood materials from Sioux Falls. Menarda. But anyway, so we're walking through this garden and we come to this more open area and there's some really beautiful flowers and I see off in the distance a little ways, there is this kind of a beautiful sculpture over there. I'm thinking, that's, that's something. Look at that, it's, this, it's all of these birds and these birds are kind of doing this swoop, swooping up into the air and they're made of metal and they're shiny and they're beautiful and I walk up to it and I take a look at it and I'm filming it and then I look and I read August 20, what was it, August 26 or August 6, no, nah, I can't remember, 2006, August 27, 2006, something like that. Flight 5191, Lexington, Kentucky. Captain thought he was on the right run, runway, but he was on a short runway, the wrong runway, and he tried to take off and he didn't have enough, he didn't have enough runway space and the plane crashed. Maybe some of you remember this. And 49 people on board perished, one lived. There's 49 birds in this sculpture And all of the names of each person that perished are encircled around the base. So here I am walking through this beautiful garden and all of a sudden, my emotions are totally hijacked, 
And like, <laughs> was not expecting that. And I leave very pensive is the word that I used, thoughtful. Each one of those birds within the body cavity of these metal birds, the family gave some sort of item from each person that was killed and it's encapsulated in each one of those birds. You see something like that and it, I'm not left unchanged. In fact, I, I got a little poetic. I wrote, I met 49 strangers today. They never met me. I met 49 who told me their story, leaving me not unchanged. This is my own pilgrim's progress, breaking forth these beautiful ashes. Isaiah 61.3 says, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. It was the practice that when you were mourning, you would take the ashes and you would spread the ashes on you. And you can imagine, especially if you're sweaty and those ashes would stick, you look like death. And what God says is, I'm going to give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. Out of the ashes, there's beauty. And what we are going to look at today is an interesting place of why God, where we say, why God? And I think you're going to hear some answers to that question. So we're going to go back to the Christmas story. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 1, 18 through 25. So if you have your Bible, turn to, your, turn to Matthew 1. If you need a Bible, there are some Bibles in the back. You can raise your hand, and I bet Jay Norberg would be glad to bring one to you. And if you need a Bible to keep, you can certainly keep one of those Bibles. Matthew 1, 18 to 25. The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. I'm going to keep reading a little bit, but it's a really strong possibility that at this point, Joseph says, why God? I thought things were going so well. I loved her. And when reading a scripture like this, it's really easy (laughs) just to read the next scripture and we hear it resolve in the next scriptures. But I think we do a disservice when we don't stop and pause and think about the agony, the anguish that he felt. In order for us to get a little bit of a feel for what Joseph was experiencing, I wanna read to you once again from the book called The Journey, Walking the Road to Bethlehem. When we meet Joseph in Matthew's gospel, He has just learned that his young betrothed was pregnant. Mary and Joseph, as we said in the previous chapter, were engaged through a legally binding ceremony. Engagement looked a little different then. Essentially, they were married, but it still needed to be consummated, and there still needed to be the wedding ceremony because there was two parts to this. In a sense, they were already married. All that was left was the official ceremony, the consummation of the marriage, the honeymoon, and to move into Joseph's home, which typically happened a year after the betrothal. It was during this in-between time that Joseph found out Mary was pregnant. Matthew tells us that Mary was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her or divorce her quietly. There's a lot that isn't said, but a lot that we can know and fill in some missing information. One, he goes on to say, Joseph must not have believed the story that Mary told about the angel and that she was a virgin who had conceived. 
If he had believed it, he would not have been looking for a way to break off the engagement. The only logical explanation was that Mary was lying to him. It's not hard to imagine what Joseph felt upon learning of Mary's apparent unfaithfulness. He would be devastated by this news. How can Mary do this? Joseph likely felt betrayed. He likely felt dishonored, humiliated, hurt by Mary and the other man. As Mary tried to explain how she came to be with child, I imagine Joseph's hurt giving way to anger. Joseph's whole world would have been shaken by this news. His trust had been violated. In his anger, he may have even reminded Mary of the consequences. Legally, she would be put to death. At some point during Joseph's 90-minute walk back to Bethlehem, his anger must have given way to concern for her life. If he told others what had happened, that Mary was pregnant with another man's child, Mary would be stoned to death. Mary's life was in his hands. Joseph was hurt, but he didn't want to see her die. He began to develop a plan. He could break off the engagement formally and legally, but to do so without explaining the reason why. See, I'll, I'll quietly divorce her. Joseph knew that after he ended the engagement, everyone would soon discover that Mary was pregnant. They would naturally assume that Joseph was the father, that he had slept with her while she was uh, while they, while they were still engaged, not before, or before they were married, then broken off the engagement, the shame would be his and not Mary's. Mary's life would be spared. She would have the pity of her family. Mary's family would keep the dowry, as law would have it. And it had already been paid. Joseph would provide the agreed upon additional dowry that would have been provided at the wedding. He would also provide for the child, and if Mary's father insisted, he could be required to take her as his wife. As Joseph heard the news and then began his journey back to Bethlehem, he might well have been convinced that this was the worst day of his life. I suspect most of us would have felt the same way. This journey was not one Joseph had anticipated. It was not a journey that he wanted to take the road back felt literally like hell. Have you ever taken a journey like that? A journey that you felt was the worst of your life? You felt that your hopes and your dreams had been crushed and you simply didn't want to go on. Here is what I want you to notice. And I'm going to read to you a verse that is so powerful. A verse a, from the book, not scripture but it's true. At the very moment when Joseph felt at his lowest that all was done, and I've seen men driven to suicide over situations like this, desperation, depression, vengeance, murder, I mean, you think about where he was at. At that time when he was at his lowest point, God was at work in Mary's womb doing the greatest thing God had done since the creation of the human race. God was orchestrating the birth of the Savior and he was inviting Joseph to be a part of it. You see, the perspective that Joseph had was a perspective that couldn't see what God could see. The very thing that God was doing, which was great and amazing, Joseph couldn't see it yet. And we read on in verse 20. But after he considered these things, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what has been conceived in her is by the Holy Spirit. 
She will give birth to a son and you are to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant, give birth to a son and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. And then Joseph follows through. The great blessing, the great joy is that God was at work doing something amazing when all he could see was desperation. It's hard for us to walk an unwanted journey. And we have and we do and we will. And it's why we need to know this truth and to trust God in knowing that God is work at work in places that we cannot see. And it's why James chapter one is so very important. James chapter one, a very common verse that you know, consider it great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, but endurance must do its complete work so that you may be mature complete, lacking nothing. Do you hear what I hear in that? If I don't go through the things that cause me to have to endure, I will not be mature in Christ. I will not be complete. I will not be finished. There is a process in my life here in living the dash that God is at work teaching me and doing something without it, I could not become like Christ. All things work out for the glory of God. Now the problem is, is that that can sometimes be used as a pat answer for hard things. And sometimes we just need to be heard in, in our hurt and, and the things that we're going through. I get that. But we have to keep looking back and how God works, and why are we here? So that we can be complete and be like him. That's why the dash. Because as creation, there would have been something that we would miss out on had we not known the joys and the pains of this life. Now that doesn't answer the question completely. I understand that. We are not going to exhaustively answer this question of why God, why the dash, but it puts us on the right path and God helps us to see it as we, especially I would encourage you to keep reading through the book of, of James or that chapter at least. No one should undergo, or no one undergoing a trial should say, I'm being tempted by God. God does not tempt, is not tempted by evil. He himself does not tempt. Each person is tempted when he is drawn and enticed away from God. Don't be deceived. God is good. Every good gift is from him. He sees, he hears, he knows the, the hard things. Verse 18, though, says, by his own choice, he gave us new birth by the message of truth so that we would be the first fruits of his, care, of his creatures. The passage steers us in the right direction. How on earth can I consider it joy that, I'm, that I go through hard things or that we go through this world? Because we know that we are being formed and shaped into his likeness. It just happened that on Wednesday, my morning devotional read like this. It said, life is a battle. Overcoming one and preparing for the next. Don't let this world take away your fight. God is equipping, guiding, giving you the battle plan. Step into victory. Be willing to march and blow the horn. Show up even when it doesn't make sense. March and watch the walls fall down. Feel the load get lighter. Joshua 1.8, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Remember how God has helped in the past. Look at his pattern of how he works in the people's lives of the Old Testament and the New Testament and be confident in Christ that he will see it through. Find your joy in knowing him and work where you can't see.
because maybe you can't see, but he can. Tabra, if you want to come back up. And uh, can I get a, a deacon to come up and pray for the offering? Thank you, Ross. Drew the short straw today, didn't you? I saw you and Josh back there doing rock, paper, scissors really quick. <laughs> now is the time for offering here at Cornerstone. Um, the little church in the back, if you would put your offering back there, and our communication slips. Uh, will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, um, thank you for this day, and thank you for the message that uh, Pastor Steve have, has brought to us today. Um, bless this offering and the tithes um, to let us use it as you see fit. Um, in your holy name, amen. Stand and join me for the last song. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by, yet in the dark streets shine. to 